Hi guys, Hunch Dane here, currently on holiday. I probably won't be on holiday by the time we get to the end of this. In fact, that's kind of the point. I always come on holiday with my longest unread book and then try and read it while I'm away. So today I'm coming at you with a review of Desperation by Stephen King. As always, I'm gonna read you the blurb and then I'm gonna share some of my flags and then I'll give you my overall thoughts and a rating at the end. This is actually paired with The Regulators, which is a Richard Bachman novel. So it's really weird, that kind of setup they have. I also thought Batman was supposed to be dead by the time that this came out. Maybe he uh, re, re uh, what's it, reincarnated him or whatever, revived him. So, the blurb, it's a long one because this is the hardback edition, so buckle up. Welcome to Desperation, a place beyond your wildest imaginings, where the unbelievable can become reality. Desperation, a small town in the middle of the Nevada desert. It looks hauntingly familiar with its signs to the Desperation coffee shop and video spot. Just off the loneliest highway in America, it should be a refuge in a wasteland, but there's something missing. The once thriving copper mining town seems eerily the once thriving copper mining town now seems eerily empty, almost abandoned, except for a few desert animals, snake, coyote, and buzzard. And of course the local cop patrolling the wilderness road, desperation's unique regulator. Headed down Highway 50 are travellers who are never going to reach their destinations. Like the Jacksons, a young professor and his wife going home to New York City. The Carvers, a Wentworth, Ohio family bound for a vacation in Lake Tahoe. And Johnny Marinville, the once famous writer who's getting back on the road with a new book, Travels with Harley. The secrets embedded in Desperation's landscape are as awesome as the forces summoned to encounter them. When they are unleashed, a terrifying transformation takes place and the wayfarers will begin to discover the true meaning of the word desperation. In the tradition of The Stand, my favourite Stephen King book, Desperation is an apocalyptic drama of God and evil, madness and revelation in which the master of horror and suspense tempts you into his literary lion's den and holds you willingly behind bars. Welcome. Enter if you dare. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these tabs. Here is one of our first introductions to this. He's basically a homicidal, crazy policeman. You have the right to remain silent, the big cop said in his robot's voice. If you do not choose to remain silent, anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. I'm going to kill you. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand your rights as I have explained them to you? And again with this, uh, this cop. So uh, he says, you're Peter. Yes, Peter Jackson. He wet his lips. The cop shifted his eyes. And you're Mary. That's right. So where's Paul? The cop asked looking at them pleasantly while the rusty leprechaun squeaked and spun on the reef of the bar behind them. What? Peter asked. I don't understand. How can you sing 500 miles or leave in on a jet plane without Paul? The cop asked. I do like, King does tend to have a lot of stuff, you know, relating back to um, popular music and stuff, which I think is pretty cool. All right, buckle in again, because this is another long section, but I don't know, this is how my mind works. <laughs> and. Um, I think if anyone, if you suffer with health anxiety or anything related to that, you will 100% relate to this long old section I'm going to read. Um, and I just think it's deep and really well written as well. So um, we're going to skip the actual introduction to this and what the incident was and just read out. That incident hadn't marked the beginning of his decline, but it had marked the point where the decline had become impossible to ignore. He wasn't just having a bad day or a bad year anymore. He was sort of having a bad life. The picture of him climbing out of the pool in his sopping white suit, a big drunk's grin on his face, had appeared in Esquire's dubious achievements issue, and after that had commenced his more or less regular appearances in Spy magazine. Spy was the place, he'd come to believe, where once legitimate reputations went to die. At least this afternoon, as he stood facing north and pissing with his shadow stretched out long to his right, these thoughts didn't hurt as much as they sometimes did. As they always did in New York, where everything hurt these days. The desert had a way of making Shakespeare's bubble reputation seem not only fragile but irrelevant. When you had become a kind of literary Elvis Presley, ageing, overweight and still at the party long after you should have gone home, that wasn't such a bad thing. He spread his legs even wider, bent slightly at the waist and let go of his penis so he could massage his lower back. He had been told that doing that helped sustain the flow a little longer and he had an idea that it did, but he knew he would still have to take a leak again long before he got to Austin, which was the next little Nevada shit splat on the long road to California. His prostate clearly wasn't what it used to be. When he thought about it these days, which was often, he pictured a bloated, crenellated thing that looked like a radiation-baked giant brain in a 50s drive-in horror movie. He should have it checked, he knew that, and not as an isolated event, but as part of a complete soup to nuts physical. Of course he should, but hey, it wasn't as if he were pissing blood or anything, and besides, well, all right, he was scared, that was the besides. 
There was a lot more to what was wrong with him than just the way his literary reputation had gone slipping through his fingers during the last five years, and quitting the pills and booze hadn't improved things as he'd hoped. In some ways, quitting had made things worse. The trouble with sobriety, Johnny had found, was that you remembered all the things you had to be scared of. He was afraid that a doctor might find more than a prostate roughly the size of the brain from planet Arus when he stuck his finger up into the literary line's nether regions. He was afraid that the doctor might find a prostate that was as black as a decayed pumpkin and as cancerous as, as Frank Zappa's had been. And even if cancer wasn't lurking there, it might be lurking somewhere else. The lung, why not? He'd smoke two packs of camels every day for 20 years, then three packs of camel lights for another 10, as if smoking camel lights was going to fix everything somehow, spruce up his bronchial tubes, polish his trachea, refurbish his poor sludge caked alveoli. Well, bullshit. He'd been off the cigarettes for 10 years now, the light as well as the heavy, but he still wheezed like an old cart horse until at least noon, and sometimes woke himself up coughing in the middle of the night. Or the stomach. Yeah, why not there? Soft pink trusting, the perfect place for disaster to strike. He had been raised in a family of ravenous meat-eaters where medium rare meant the cook had breathed hard on the steak and the concept of well done was unknown. He loved hot sauces and hot peppers. He did not believe in fruits and salads unless one was badly constipated. He'd eaten like that his whole fucking life, still ate like that, and would probably go on eating like that until they slammed him into a hospital bed and started feeding him all the right things through a plastic tube. The brain? Possible. Quite possible. A tumour, or maybe, here was an especially cheerful thought, an unseasonably early case of Alzheimer's. The pancreas? Well, that one was fast at least. Express service, no waiting. Heart attack, cirrhosis, stroke. How lightly they all sounded. How logical. In many interviews, he had identified himself as a man outraged by death, but that was pretty much the same old big balls crap he'd been selling throughout his career. He was terrified of death, that was the truth. And as a result of spending his life honing his imagination, he could see it coming from at least four dozen different directions. And late at night when he couldn't sleep, he was apt to see it coming from four dozen different directions at once. Refusing to see the doctor, to have a checkup and let them peek under the hood, would not cause any of those diseases to pause in their approach or their feeding upon him, if indeed the feeding had already begun. But if he stayed away from the doctors and their devilish machines, he wouldn't have to know. You didn't have to deal with a monster under the bed or lurking in the corner if you never actually turned on the bedroom lights. That was the thing. And what no doctor in the world seemed to know was that, for men like Johnny Maranville, fearing was sometimes better than finding, especially when you put out the welcome mat for every disease going. Uh, we have this little bit here, a mention for John Cheever, who I read recently because uh, he was in the vintage mini moderns box set and he, his book was called Drinking. Johnny told her he had no intention of spending the rest of his life sitting in church basements with a bunch of drunks, all of them talking about how wonderful it was to have a power greater than oneself before getting back into their old cars and driving home to their mostly spouseless houses to feed their cats. People in AA are generally too fundamentally broken to see that they've turned their lives over to an empty concept and a failed ideal, he said. Take it from me, I've been there. Or take it from John Cheever if you like. He wrote particularly well about that. John Cheever isn't writing much these days, Terry replied. I think you know why too. And yeah, we got this in the uh, blurb, so I don't really need to read this out, but uh, he decides he's gonna write a book called Travels with Harley, because he rides a Harley Davidson. And it's a reference back to Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck, which I haven't read yet. I know Madman Reads and Rocks has read it. I watched his review, it sounded really good. Um, And this character, you know, his most prized criticism he's ever received or whatever literary criticism was that he was said uh, somebody said that he was the only American living writer that could compare with uh, John Steinbeck I thought this was interesting as well uh, so this the policeman ends up meeting him and obviously it goes a bit south quite quickly but some statistics here that that um, I assume are true I, I've not heard before so he says he's talking about uh, this writer's motorbike and he says And this is no kind of transportation for a, a, well, I've got to say it, for a national resource. Why, do you realise what the ratio of drivers to accidents on motorcycles is? Computed on a road hours basis. I can tell you that because I'm a wolf and we get a circular every month from the National Safety Council. It's one accident per 460 drivers per day. That sounds good, I know, until you consider the ratio of drivers to accidents on passenger vehicles. That's one in 27,000 per day. That's some big difference. It makes you think, doesn't it? Makes me glad I don't ride a motorbike. All right, as predicted, I'm back at home and I still haven't finished it. Uh, We actually had to come back a day early because of all the coronavirus stuff. I've got a few bits I'm going to update you on. Just this little saying, which I quite liked. Lips which lie are best kept silent. This little bit here about some truckers I thought was entertaining. A refrigerator truck roared past, the guy laying on his horn all the way by, even though Steve had squeezed over until the stubby rider was mostly on the shoulder, and the road itself was empty in both directions. No big surprise about that, though. 
In Steve's experience, some guys simply couldn't keep their hands off their horns or their dicks. They were always honking one or the other. There's this little paragraph here about um, basically this little kid. It, it, he's been uh, in a road traffic accident. And I want to read this bit out here because I thought it was pretty beautifully put. It was not terror this thought had called up in his mind and heart, but despair, as if the image of Brian's fingers laced together in his coffin proved that nothing was worth anything, that doing never once in the world stopped dying, that not even kids were exempted from the horror show that roared on and on behind the peppermint sitcom facade your parents believed in and wanted you to believe in. And then there's this bit where this cop is trying to run somebody down, and uh, I'm going to read this paragraph. Billy Rancourt screamed. Johnny turned in the back seat of the cruiser and saw him crawling as fast as he could toward the north side of the street. That wasn't very fast. He was trailing a broken leg. There were tread marks running across the back of his shirt and the seat of his jeans. His cowboy hat was sitting on the pavement, now turned upside down like the bicycles. Billy Rancourt bumped it with one knee, knocking it aslant, and blood poured out over the brim like water. More blood was gushing from his split skull and broken face. He was badly hurt, but although he had been struck amidships and then run over, he didn't appear even close to dead. That didn't surprise Johnny much. Most times it took a lot to kill a man. He'd seen it again and again in Vietnam. Guys alive with half their heads blown off. Guys alive with their guts piled in their laps and drawing flies. Guys alive with their jugulars spouting through their dirty fingers. People usually died hard. That was the horror of it. And then we get a reference to another piece of music, uh, One Piece at a Time by Johnny Cash. Great tune. Again, I really like it when Stephen King refers to music in his work. So this was interesting where this kid called David, he's got his hands on a gun and he's fighting a coyote. And I just thought, there's a great line here um, about how uh, this character had never enjoyed his own kids much. I'll read out the full paragraph. David dropped to one knee beside it and put the barrel of the forty-five against the dangling head. He then turned his own head away. Johnny saw the kid's eyes clench shut and his heart went out to the boy. He had never enjoyed his own kids much. They had a tiresome way of upsetting you for the first twenty years and trying to upstage you for the second twenty. But one like this wouldn't be so bad to have around, maybe. He had some game, as the basketball players said. And then uh, this character basically sees the body of her husband and um, the writer character sort of feeling very human. He led her swiftly toward the door marked town safety officer, trying to think how they should proceed. And here was another disgusting little facet of this experience. He was becoming aroused by Mary Jackson. She was quivering in the circle of his arm. He could feel the softness of her breast just above his hand, and he wanted her. Her husband was hung up like a fucking overcoat right behind them, but he was still getting a fairly respectable stiffy, especially for a man with possible prostate woes. Terry, Terry was right all along, he thought. I am an asshole. Uh, we get Tom Waits' reference here. He handed her the 3006, thinking of an old Tom Waits song. Black crow shells from the 3006, Waits sang in his stripped and somehow ghoulish voice. Whittle you into kindling. We get a Tom Sawyer reference. And then this character here, she's feeling bad, uh... She realised she could use a toilet herself, and that no matter how the place smelled, she was hungry as well. Why not? She hadn't had anything to eat for almost eight hours. She felt guilty about being hungry when Peter would never eat again, but she supposed the feeling would pass. That was the hell of it when you thought it over. That was the exact hell of it. So uh, we start to find out what caused the outbreak of all this evil, and uh, there was a theory amongst the Chinese miners there uh, that they made the Tommyknockers mad. And then, what are Tommyknockers, David asked. Troublemakers, Johnny said. The underground version of Gremlins. And uh, I read the Tommyknockers, reread it, I think last month actually. So that was quite interesting, just a nice little tie in there. I like the way that these two terms were sort of contrasted against each other. Not disbelief, but unbelief. The first is natural, the second willful. And then we get this little conversation about, you know, why did the policeman bring us here in the first place? He didn't. What? He thinks he did, but he didn't. I don't have any idea what you're... God brought us, David said, to stop him. And it is true that the cop just killed everybody else and he chose to keep certain people alive. And there's this little bit, Were they possessed of God, David? Marinville asked. There was no sarcasm in his voice now. Possessed by God? What do you think? I don't think so, David said. I don't think God has to possess. That's what makes him God. I think they wanted what God wanted, to keep tack in the earth. This is a great little quote as well. Life is more than just steering a course around pain. And then Tack, which is basically this malevolent spirit. He knows where he's going to go if it all goes wrong. Alphaville, a vegan commune in the Des Desertoyas. They wouldn't be vegans for long after Tack arrived. Vegan power! Yay! I like this bit as well. And what does Tack want? To get out of its hole in the ground and stretch its legs? Eat pork rinds? Snort cocaine and drink tequila sunrises? 
Screw some NFL cheerleaders. Ask Bob Dylan what the lyrics to Gates of Eden really mean. Rule the earth. What? And David says it doesn't matter. And then we get this little bit as well. And um, the way that Cynthia does it is the way that I would do the Lord's Prayer. So, our father, Johnny said, stepping easily onto the road of the old prayer, as if he had never been away. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The others joined in, Cynthia, the minister's daughter, first, Mary last. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the Amen, Cynthia continued on. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. She looked up with a little twinkle Johnny had come to like quite a lot. That's the way I learned it. Kind of a Protestant dance mix, you know? That's the way we used to have to do it when they made us pray at school. And when they made us pray at school, that's the reason that I became non-religious. Anyway, all in all, I really enjoyed this book. I think Stephen King does a great job with a small town thing. But also, there's a lot in this that reminds me of, like, slasher movies. Like, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and things like that. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Very solid book. I'm surprised people don't talk about it more often. And I would recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Desperation. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.